Um, well, um, you're going to send to another. Patrick, thank you for the invitation to speak here at uh, this second international Gunnar Aspel symposium. And I know the first one was when? 86, I believe. I found the book in the library. So it's a great honor and privilege, I guess, to be speaking here. Um, I've been conducting work on Gunnar Asplund and other protagonists of modern architecture in the Nordic countries over the past few years, and um, regarding Asplund in particular two projects. One I did in 2014 and 15, while at Schalmest I reconstructed the architecture of the Stockholm exhibition of 1930. Together with students, we reconstructed the pavilions. Mm -hmm. And then in 2018, I published an, um, you might say, critical annotated German translation of Acceptera. And I was interested in both these things, the exhibition and the book, as sort of historic documents to see how were they sort of constructed or designed or written, not so much what impact they have on Swedish society going forward, so more on sort of them as documents, not so much as we would say in German, their Wirkungsgeschichte, but rather their Entstehungsgeschichte. Now teaching at an art history institute, you become very aware of the distinction of these things. And one of the conclusions I found <clears throat> of my research is that both of these things, the exhibition and the book, are heavily shaped by the fact that modern architecture in the Nordic countries is not so much the result of a revolutionary upheaval following World War I, but rather on the one hand, I believe to a lesser degree, the result of certain gradual developments in the Nordic countries, certain rationalization efforts that start very early on, but then, I believe to a larger degree, the result of a, you might say, cultural transfer from those avant-garde movements on the European continent to the north by the protagonists of modern architecture, mainly the later half of the 1920s. This starts around 1920s. So in this context, the Stockholm exhibition and Acceptera are of special significance as they sort of weave together or bundle these different kind of influences and they present, as I believe, a comprehensive vision for modern architecture in the Nordic countries and they really sort of promote the breakthrough of both. But one of the things I'm going to talk about in my short presentation today is the comprehensive nature of both. Both the exhibition as well as the manifesto are much more ambitious and larger in scope than most of their um, continental counterparts. And this I find to be quite interesting and might be sort of one of the reasons why uh, why, let's say, modernism or functionalism, as it's later called after 1930 here in the Nordic countries, becomes the model for um, this architecture and the arts and crafts of the social democratic welfare state. And one of the roots um, for this comprehensive nature, or one very early root of this comprehensive nature, is the work of Gregor Bolson, who very early on, already during his long stay in Berlin in 1912, uh, gets into contact with uh, the German Bergbund or Deutsche Bergbund, and he gets to know this idea of a collaboration between art and industry um, to also promote, you might say, social progress. This is one of the key ideas of the German Bergbund, die Veredelung der gewerblichen Arbeit as it's called, and they carry it from, as they call it, from the sofa cushion to urban planning. And he repeats these ideas in many of his subsequent works. For instance, in his 1950 lecture, Anarchy, or Style of the Time, he calls for this new style of the time based on contemporary circumstances, a cooperation between engineers and artists, 
as well as industrial production. And in his 1916 book, The New Architecture, he expands these ideas to include things like rationalization. And in his 1919 book, Better Things for Everyday Life, Wapaswara, um, he outlines a sort of comprehensive program for the reform of the arts and crafts here in Sweden, sort of weaving all of these things together to sort of um, present this comprehensive program of reforming not only architecture but arts and crafts in order to sort of create this new modern future society. And these ideas also form the basis of one of the sort of roots for the um, Stockholm exhibition. And when in 1927, when Gregor Poulsson sets out to organize the exhibition, he envisions it to be a comprehensive and future oriented sorry, the slides are out of order. He, oriented, he um, envisions it to be a comprehensive sort of overall display of all of these efforts, considerably more extensive and ambitious. And um, his argument, quote, is that arts and crafts and industry are not isolated phenomena, but are simply a sign of the new time. And he wants to sort of promote that. So when he uh, starts to plan this, I mean, this has been covered fairly well in, in literature, but I think there are still some sort of missing, missing issues with that. Um, Gregor Poulsen, who is appointed head up, how does it look back? At the lower bottom, I think. Yeah, I can do Okay, it. yeah, perfect. When Gunnar Asplund, who is appointed to the lead architect for the exhibition by Gregor Poulsen, I mean, the choice has also been debated in literature by Asplund, and he was obviously not the most progressive Swedish architect at that time. Um, Aspen makes sort of these three different types of drafts, or three different attempts uh, to design the exhibition. And in 1927, um, Gregor Poulsen and Aspen undertake this famous journey to the European continent to see other exhibitions and talk to a number of people. And here, I think, lies another sort of important sort of aspect for the architecture of the exhibition pavilions because um, I found it quite curious whom they meet and what they see um, on these travels. They obviously visit the Werkbund uh, Siedlung Die Wohnung or the Werkbund Exhibition Die Wohnung in Stuttgart Weißenhof which was in that year uh, but they also see later on the upcoming Werkbundsiedlung in Brünn, a new house in 28, which is far uh, less known. But they also talk to Siegfried Gideon and in uh, particular Josef Hoffmann in Vienna. And I think that the Austrian Werkbund uh, scene is often overlooked in sort of considering the development of the Swedish Werkbund, as Hoffmann was both planning the 1930 exhibition in Vienna as head of Wiener Werkstätten, but also planning the Werkbundsiedlung 1932. And the exhibition pavilion here by Ernst Lichtblau is quite similar in architectural terms uh, like Asplund's uh, exhibition architecture. Even the, uh, one of the pamphlets published for the third 1930 uh, exhibition sort of billige Reprodukte für jedermann, sort of cheaper products for everyone, is quite similar in slogan to Gregor Paulson's Better Things for Everyday Life and sort of similar kind of exhibition slogans presented um, at the Stockholm exhibition. I have not really looked very far into it, but this is sort of one of the questions that I've um, encountered since doing the reconstruction of the um, exhibition pavilions. Or you might say this sort of. Yeah. Um, maybe one, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but also the other sort of exhibition pavilions they see, um, or plans for, for these pavilions that they see, I mean, this has also been described in literature, 
Uh, Le Corbusier's Nestle Pavilion from 1928, Elisitsky's uh, Presser Pavilion in Cologne from 28, also Alma Altus and Erik Brückmann's exhibition Seven Hundred Years in Turku. Um, uh, I mean, the, the friendship between Asplund and Alto has been fairly well covered. They knew each other, and Alto knew of Asplund's designs for the Stockholm exhibition, just trying to be faster and incorporate many of the same ideas. So uh, you might really see the Stockholm exhibition as sort of. Um, well, sort of sister exhibition for the Stockholm exhibition just sort of one year earlier, um, as it also was considerably smaller in scale. Um, all of these things um, are quite fascinating how they are reflected in the exhibition architecture, or rather, um, how how Gunnar Asplund sort of translates this into the exhibition architecture. I'm not going into too much detail about the individual pavilions. Uh, I mean, we built them as models. You may have uh, seen in, I think they have been on display here in Stockholm, I think at least once or twice. Um, <clears throat> but it's quite interesting to see how these different ideas are sort of uh, fused together in the architecture of the exhibition, sort of dividing it up into individual pavilions, not a sort of monumental central building. These pavilions form a sort of, you might say, symbiosis almost with the natural surroundings. This also is in tune with Gregor Paulson's program to not have a sort of uh, museum like uh, exhibition. Uh, um, they talk about avoiding the pompousness of the museum, but rather presenting these new arts and crafts and these new industrial products in a home-like or commercial-like environment, sort of like in a department store or like being used at home. <coughs> Hence, these sort of small-scale pavilions and also the housing exhibition parts. And of course, they make fun of uh, the German sort of uh, strict exhibition and talk about, they have this very nice quote of talking of beauty and festivity and uh, turning the whole thing into a single huge uh, Stockholm festival, which they, I think, succeeded in doing. But it's, yeah, here, very nice, one of the exhibition halls for the books, where you can really see how the books are on display, like in, like in a department store, in these kind of exhibition racks. Um, people could wander around, and also the use of sort of advertising, like large posters and photography, and uh, bright colors, and all of these things, which which have been written about extensively. Um, in literature. But what's also quite interesting is that a sort of similar, sort of carefully constructed, comprehensive vision is what guides the narrative or the construction of Acceptera, which they already start to uh, write before the end of the exhibition. Um, I mean, there was this criticism that the exhibition was un-Swedish or like um, American advertising or like German functional architecture. I mean, there is a certain kernel of truth in all of this criticism. But they apparently already in the summer or autumn of 1930 start to plan the book. And although the exact process of writing process is not very well uh, documented. Uh, we know that there were some preliminary meetings. Apparently, Gregor Olsen and Gunnar Asplund took the initiative to sort of write this manifesto. Uh, they also invite, invited uh, four other architects involved with the exhibition to join them in this effort. The individual chapters were sort of assigned to the different People, but they still presented themselves as a collective in tune with the sort of modern attitude or the modern uh, attitude at that time to sort of be a um, 
collective of authors. And uh, this whole work sort of culminates in a week-long, um, you might say, enclave, uh, I believe, in a hotel outside um, Stockholm at a holiday uh, resort, where they basically fuse all these things together into the thing. But um, if also, if you look at the book itself, it's quite interesting how it's constructed. In, and I didn't really understand how the different parts are um, put together in a way as to maximize the didactic effect of their arguments. Um, it really sort of starts out in a very particular manner. And again, the comprehensive nature and the careful or the ambitious scope I believe goes far beyond other manifestos of the 1920s of that time. Although one has to say that, I mean, there are countless other books that were published in the 1920s of a sort of similar kind of nature, also sort of collages of texts and images put together. Um, you all know the Bauhaus books or Le Corbusier's books from 1923 moving on. Um, but still, among them, Acceptera is quite special. And already on the frontispiece and the title, the authors um, present the central question, namely, uh, accept the reality as it is, sort of accept the idea of progress. And then they present this notion that there is a third way between the individual and the masses, and they, of course, pick up that sort of Volkheim slogan, Volksheim, or People's Home slogan coined by the Social Democrats in Sweden just a few years prior, and that also became the sort of fighting slogan moving on uh, for the Social Democratic welfare state. But the individual sort of chunks of the book are quite interesting. Maybe in the first three chapters, they talk about society in the present, and the future. And um, <clears throat> in the first chapter, it is hard to be objective. I'm sorry, I have to read this as um, tr I'm trying to sort of quote them. They argue for a specific notion of historic progress um, according to a certain pattern. And there they, of course, follow the idea of Alois Riegel's Kunstwollen, that is sort of history has a certain momentum that articulates itself in all aspects of culture. And in the second chapter, the cultural situation, they look at Sweden. They refer to this French economist, Francis de Lazy, who describes Europe as, a, as being divided between A Europe and B Europe, B Europe being the sort of backwards agricultural Europe 150 years behind, while A Europe is sort of the um, industrialized, progressive urban Europe. And Sweden is sort of sitting right in between. They even have a diagram showing that the border between A Europe and B Europe is right, goes through Stockholm, you know, in north of Stockholm is sort of the, is sort of the wilderness of the medieval times and south of Stockholm is sort of civilization. It's sort of like the Hadrian's Wall, if you like. Uh, in the next chapters, uh, in the next three chapters, they develop a comprehensive progress program for rationalized housing that is largely based on their experiences of the housing section of the Stockholm exhibition, as well as earlier articles by the Acceptera authors. Uh, you can really see how uh, the uh, chapters like the society we are building for, they describe how society is changing as a result of industrialization and what this means for the average worker, sort of what will I get paid, how does my uh, life look like, what does industrial work mean, and they really try to describe on the one hand the advantages of um, industrial labor, uh, but also the advantages of this new modern 
uh, society with things like mass culture, cinema, leisure time, sailing, I mean all these kind of nice photos in Aksetera where they show people sort of on vacation and at home and they really try to um, present to Swedish people this sort of new way of life that they want to promote. Um, but then in the next chapter, what is required of housing, they set out to sort of really solve this housing issue by comparing the different kinds of typologies. And here they essentially copy um, or at least um, pick up the, this discussion of rationalized housing on the European continent, um, copying almost Walter Gropius' uh, discourse on a hoch, mittel, flachbau, sort of perimeter blocks, skyscrapers, or low, flat, dense urban housing. And they also, uh, uh, in a way, compare these different kinds of typologies using the same kinds of diagrams, and they also refer to uh, different kinds of examples for this kind of uh, industrialized, prefabricated housing, and it struck me that they were using, or they are showing in Aksetera, three of the most well-known examples uh, from the later half of the 1920s for this kind of prefabricated uh, constructions, namely the Haus Wenkenhalde by Paul Artaria and Hans Schmidt, one of the most well-known steel um, skeleton houses from the second half of the 1920s in journals like Steinholz Eisen, and it was frequently featured also in Wasmund's Monatsheft and uh, <clears throat> also in other journals, but also, uh, of course, Ernst Mays. Uh, housing in Frankfurt, which sort of is a is a uh, way to present this sort of large scale industrialized housing, but also, of course, Dessau Turton by Walter Gropius. In the second half of the book, one of the main arguments that is still missing from the second half of the book is the notion of well, how does this sort of permeate society? And here the arts and crafts come in because. Here, in the next three chapters, they, um, <clears throat> like in the chapter on home comfort, they use the arguments of the reform movement to sort of refute the criticism against the modern movement. And in chapter industry and handicraft, they continue to elaborate of this reform in the arts and crafts, calling for a unity of the arts to sort of pro promote social progress. And it's quite interesting that they almost verbatim uh, quote Otto Wagner, of course, recalling Gottfried Semper in the necessity of the arts and crafts to sort of, um, as a sort of precursor to promoting the reform of architecture for sort of social progress. And in the chapter form, they set out to outline this new style based on industrialization, housing, and the reform of the arts and crafts. Here, everything sort of comes together in this sort of new unity on what they call the utilitarian art, or nutokunst, or functionalism, as it's later called. And they pick up this term that Bruno Oren had coined in 1926 and defined in 1927 as the economically working form, funkies, that becomes the new slogan sort of moving for, forward. Although I've been very critical on that, on about this term as it means something completely different in the Nordic countries than in the discourse on the European continent. According to Adolf Bene, for, ex for instance, Funktionalismus is the organic architecture of someone like Hugo Hering or Hans Scharoun. So it's not the same thing. Mm. Um, but all of this sort of ends um, in this almost Cree-like coda of the book where they really tie everything together, that sort of utilitarian art that is sort of the result of this idea of progress and this sort of 
evolution of history that simply has to take place. This is sort of the movement of history. And here they sort of tie everything together, sort of industrialization, the reform of the arts and craft, uh, uh, mass uh, prefabricated housing, all of this sort of woven together in this very concise and um, sort of precise thing that then becomes sort of functionalism for the new sort of social democratic welfare state. But um, what I was hoping to show is that both the scope of the Stockholm exhibition as well as the way that Axel is sort of constructed as a manifesto, how the different chunks of the texts or how the different chapters are written sort of really mirror each other sort of scope on the different kinds of threats that they see on the European continent, or that also the different kinds of reforms that they are um, calling for, and also the text of the book, they are sort of, you might say, two sides of a coin, um, without into going into too much detail. I mean, I've <laughs> written these two books and also the uh, you are probably more interested in the exhibition pavilions and the use of new materials and these prefabrication processes. Uh, they are really sort of served this purpose that they describe in the manifesto. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.